what was it that first kind of made you think, this is the story I want to tell? What was the moment it really crystallized for you? There were two things that grabbed me immediately, and I wasn't thinking about making a television show or anything. I was just reading about Chernobyl, and, and the first thing was that they were running a safety test, which as a writer, you know, if you if you work that in fictionally as some sort of fake irony, you're, you're, you're going to be in trouble. But if it really happened that way, that is kind of remarkable. And then the, the next thing I read was that the man that was put in charge of fixing this problem uh, committed suicide two years to the day after the explosion. And again, it just seemed very um, dramatic. Suddenly, it just seemed like the facts were dramatic inherently. But that in and of itself isn't enough. And then I just started reading more. And then when I understood that there were these levels of insanity and and things about Chernobyl that I had no idea. I thought the worst of it was that it exploded. I didn't realize there was more beyond that that was even worse and worse and worse. So that, But that was kind of the, the, the initial things that grabbed me. Jared, um, your character's relationship with Boris Shabina is kind of this bromance that we can all hold on to while we're kind of white knuckling it through the tragedies in the show. Um, can you talk a little bit about working with Stellan um, and how you, you kind of got to that place with him? Uh, it, very easy. I mean, Stellan is he's absolutely delightful. Um, he's, uh, he's got a wicked sense of humor. He's incredibly easygoing. Um, he, I mean, you just, you want him to like you. He's got one of those personalities. And um, uh, it was, I mean, easy. And then, of course, he and Emily had this relationship based on breaking the waves. So um, th there was that immediate camaraderie there. So it, it was that, but that was really easy. He also, I, he gave her some brilliant advice that I've, that I um, was helpful and I, I think about all the time, which was, because uh, Breaking the Waves was her first movie and um, she'd done plays and theater and stuff, but not a film before. And she asked him um, for any advice before they started. And he said, um, uh, and now I've forgotten it. <laughs> um, he said, uh, um, uh, don't, don't aim for anything, just let go. And uh, it was, it's always good advice. Because you have to come in with a plan in your back pocket what you think you're gonna try and achieve with a scene, but you have to be prepared to let go immediately because you've got no idea what the other person's gonna do, you know? And hopefully they're gonna, they'll do something, you're like, what are they doing? Right, I, you need to like respond. And, but that's what makes it interesting, you know? <laughs> I mean, we, we all wanna be Stellan. I mean, he's really tall and he's really handsome and he's incredibly talented. He's got 14 children, they're all movie stars. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> He's the best, yeah. Like, in fact, he's such a good guy, I can't even be jealous of him. It's ridiculous. Yeah. You see how handsome his kids are? The fuck? <laughs> yeah. They all live near each other. They've I know, got, they they've love got, each they've other. They have houses near each they other. They don't have problems. His ex-wife lives near them as well with his yeah. new wife, and they've got a house next door. They and, drink a lot, but they don't yeah. have drinking problems. Yeah. It's like... It's, yeah. just, it's amazing. Consistently, every time I talk to people that create uh, stories about real life events, there's always some pushback. Um, but the level of research that you did was extraordinary. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what went into it? Yeah. Um, well, it was a bit like going back to school, you know, and doing a very large, large term paper. Um, you, you gather your sources and you kind of organize them. You have different kinds of sources. Uh, you know, the, the ones that you rely on sort of the least are the, the true third party accounts where maybe somebody who isn't Soviet uh, has written an account, you know, in 1993 about Chernobyl and they've gathered what they know. Those are, those are somewhat useful. Better when you have those accounts from people who were inside the Soviet Union and involved directly in either the politics or the cleanup. Then you have various articles. You have the scientific periodicals, because you have to understand how the, the very first bit of research I did was go down to USC and talk to a nuclear physicist. And basically, I did a version of tell me how a nuclear reactor works. And, and he did. And it's actually not that complicated. I mean, that's the thing. You know, it really, <clears throat> I got excited because I thought, I can explain this to people. Um, 
But then as you go on, you get deeper and deeper in and you start asking these really pesky questions. And I had to ask like a lot of scientists a lot of questions. Um, but the most valuable parts of the research were the first person accounts. And anywhere I could find one of those, I would just grab onto it and hold it and, and really care about it. And um, there's a wonderful book um, by Svetlana Alexeyevich called Voices from Chernobyl, which is nothing but first person accounts. And it that's where the humanity comes through because ultimately you need to be uh, two things at once. You do have to be a term paper writer and then you also have to be somebody who understands the purpose of making a television show, which is to portray human beings feeling human things in such a way that we can relate and that it matters to us. So it, you, it's a very left brain, right brain uh, exercise. But uh, I loved it. I mean, I, I'll, I'll do it again, I, I guess. <laughs> um, I did want to also ask you both about, did you both go to Pripyat? Uh, for real, um, because I've heard that it's possibly not that safe to be there even now. Well, no, it's, it's I mean, I, I, yes, I went to Pripyat and to the surrounding areas and tromped through a forest and, and went into Chernobyl itself and got us, they wouldn't let us go all the way into four, I, they knew we were with HBO, so they were a little tense. <laughs> you know, uh, if one of us got sick, it would be a story, I guess. Um, but they were really careful with us. But we, you, there are areas that you, you shouldn't go to, um, and they don't take you there. We had a person with us the whole time who had his own dosimeter. He was an independent safety person. So what's that? It worked. The dosimeter. Yeah. Apparently, yeah. we'll find out. It went beyond. <laughs> um, <laughs> He never turned it on. Oh, sorry. Uh, I forgot to turn it on, but I'm sure everything's fine. 3.6. Uh, well, they actually, they, in addition to that, like, beep, beep, beep thing, they, everybody gets a little passage dosimeter, which is just a little piece of film inside of a cartridge, and it measures your overall exposure to radiation over time. And then when you're done with your trip, you hand it to them, and I said, when will I find out? And they're like, oh, we'll, we'll let you know if there's a problem. Uh, they didn't let me know, so I'm okay. Um, but in g the God's honest truth is they, they've mapped it all very carefully. You get more radiation flying uh, in, from New York to LA than you do walking around the streets of Pripyat. Although, I will say, at one point we were by that iconic Ferris wheel and there's a, t I'm just like, oh, and there's a tap on my shoulder and one of our guides goes, oh, not on manhole. And I was standing in <laughs> manhole and I'm like, oh yeah, because the metal is, eh. was, okay, sorry. Um, and I got worried for like two seconds, and I'm like, nah, I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, but the we did, we were in the pump room of reactor three, which is as close as we could get to reactor four. And in there, the dosimeter's beeping. And um, yeah, we the guy was like, well, we have about a minute in here. And I was like, mm, we're a half minute, it's cool. <laughs> we need the whole minute. Yeah. Just, I, I know what this is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it's a very specific path they take you on, isn't it? It's sort of about, it's like a, a route through a minefield, right? Because if you can, as someone explained, that if you sort of take four or ten paces off and rest your foot on a rock that's covered in moss to tie up your moss shoelace, bad, yeah. you, that can mess you up. Yeah, moss, mushrooms, those kinds of things are really, they're, they're, they've got it down. They're, they're pretty good about it. I hope, I believe them. I'm going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine. But don't lean casually against metal buses or swings or things like that, like these Instagrammers yeah. are doing with their arse out. Oh, that's so <laughs> Apart from being disrespectful, uh, you're dosing yourself in a you know, potentially unhealthy way. <laughs>